Hi guys, welcome to another Word Electronics Repair video. I have on the workbench today quite a large audio amplifier, a Poweramp PA. It's uh, I believe a three kilowatt one, so it's quite high powered. And this is the sort of thing that they use in clubs and concerts and on this island for the carnivals. So I need to repair this amplifier and I thought it would be a good opportunity uh, because of some of the comments I've had recently to other videos, I know that a lot of you guys would like to see a video all you need to know about audio amplifiers to fix stuff. And you know what guys, that's a really, really big subject and I'm not quite sure at the moment I can actually put all that together in one. But what I thought I would do is make this video, which is a beginner's guide to audio amplifier repair. This is to get you started. So, first of all, let's have a look at the amplifier we have, a quick look around it. Then let's have a look at the theory of amplifier design, the types of amplifier you're commonly likely to find. No mathematics, just the difference between the common types of amplifier you're going to find, audio amplifier. And when we've done that, let's do a practical, so we're going to attempt to repair this amplifier. I hope you're looking forward to this, so let's get started. Um, I have an amplifier here. This thing's so heavy. Oh, God, they picked the thing up. It must weigh about 25, 30 kilos. I mean, Hill uh, DX3000, I think it's a three kilowatt power amplifier. And if you guys wonder, I mean, it's like 1500 watts per channel. If you look at these little amplifiers they make these days, and they say, what? 1500 watts per channel. Why do you think it takes this much weight in the electronics to make an amplifier that can deliver that power? Yeah, God, it's heavy. I think the guy uh, this uh, belongs to, he, he has a company to so do uh, PA systems and such like. He does carnivals. You have these carnivals here in the street with big uh, articulated wagons coming down, trucks with dance floors on them and, you know, PA system so powerful they actually shake the ground uh, and that's I think what this uh, comes from so uh, I've taken the end off you can see there's lots and lots of transistors in here um, two four six eight ten down each side and uh, obviously two channels and this is I think it's actually the rear side of this so you see the transformer the uh, electrolytic capacitors in here 18,000 microfarad, 125 volts each of these, so you don't want to be touching them if you're worried about capacitors with charging, that's for sure. Um, and that actually means that when this is powered up, if there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of voltage in this, so although you think, well, it's an amplifier, it's got a transformer, it doesn't mean it's not necessarily hazardous to work on in some respects. Um, yeah. This has been added on here. This is uh, something I actually, I actually did this a few years ago. So there was a thermal trip or like a kind of like a, a fuse trip on the back that was faulty. And uh, let's see, it's on here somewhere. Can't quite see it. I know when I looked at this before and it was working then. So there was a trip in here somewhere that was faulty and I couldn't get the one of a physical size uh, to replace it. So I actually wired one inside here. You can see this thing here. It does the job. I think, yes, I remember now. So let's have a look at on the front of this. The on-off switch, which I can hardly get into the shot. The weight of this damn thing. Ah. The on-off switch effectively had two poles and one side of it was like a, a thermal chip that would trip out and it was open circuit so I wired this in so we still have a thermal trip and I mounted this here so that's actually on the main power coming in yeah it comes through this and then goes off down to the uh, transformer I've turned the amplifier over so you can have a look at the other side there was two metal plates here which I've removed and uh, we can see the other side of the amplifier modules now. So, I mean, straight away I can see some uh, couple of transformers, a couple of relays, I notice. And um, 
I'm not sure how easily I can actually get these amplifier modules out of here. But we can see uh, a positive and negative supply coming in, and there's two of them on each of the amplifier modules. This is probably well, ground, I'm guessing, so it'll be the plus and the minus supply. We can see this on those capacitors on the other side as well. I'll show you again in a moment. Uh, so this is basically what we have to work on uh, with this. Yes, we have on this side, we can see again, we can see the red and the black. And then I'm guessing that the, these are all connected together, these parts, these capacitors. We can just have a look. Uh, I'm just going to use my fluke meter for a moment because somebody said that I needed to clean my multimeter. So I actually did this most sensible thing, which was to take the casing off it, this plastic, take it home and ask the wife to wash it. <laughs> that worked quite well. Uh, so let's just have a look. So I'm, I'm pretty much assuming that both ends of these are actually connected together. Yep, that looks like it is. And that looks like it is, yeah. And then we'll have the supply, so we can just check. There's no short circuits on here. That, that's a good thing. Let's go to the other ones. This is the negative end. But we'll go to the other polarity just to check it. Yeah, you can see the capacitors charging up. Okay. Yeah. So there's no short circuits on it. That's nice to see. Um also just looking down here i can see two bridge rectifiers this one and this one this one has the um red wires going to it yeah well yeah one red one black so this bridge rectifier is effectively across the two ends of here and this is this ground this will be a center tap on the transformer and the same here we have another bridge rectifier which is the red and black here and again, these will go to a centre tap on the transformer. And down in the middle is a third bridge rectifier, which comes from two orange wires here. And um, that has then some thin black and red wires on. So I'm assuming this is like a low voltage supply to uh, the uh, circuitry, not the main uh, amplifier section, but the sort of the uh, components before that, like the preamplifier, if you like. So that's what we appear to have. Um, but let's have a look first, so I'll, I'll draw this out what we have and while we're doing that let's have a look at amplifier design in general and amplifier repair in general. So we can make this a beginner's guide to audio amplifier repair. I doubt it's possible to do an all you need to know, it's such a big topic. But let's get the basics first, let's get a good grounding with this and then we can start repairing amplifiers. Probably the first thing you need to know about audio amplifiers is they are not all the same. In the same way that power supplies come in different types, you get linear power supplies, switch mode power supplies, or even something like an ATX power supply if you saw the recent video I made, there's a number of common designs or topologies. And that's also true of audio amplifiers. With amplifiers, these designs are called classes. So you may have seen this. You get uh, things like a class A amplifier, uh, a class D amplifier, and so on. This class has nothing to do with the actual quality of the amplifier. It's not a case that a class A amplifier has better performance or better sound quality than class B, and so on. These classes are the topology, the design of the amplifier. Amplifier classes go from A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. But not all of these designs or topologies or classes are actually audio amplifiers. There are some classes that are RF, radio frequency amplifiers. The classes that you will find with audio amplifiers are these ones. You have class A, you have class B, you have class AB, which is basically a combination of these two, a kind of a halfway house. Then you have class D, you have class G, 
and you have class H. So these are the different topologies, the types of audio amplifiers that you're likely to come across if you do repair work. So of course, you're going to want to know what is the difference between all these classes. So let's have a look at each one in turn and I'll explain briefly how each one works. And then after we've been through this theory, we can look at our amplifier, see which class ours is, and then we can get on with the repair. The class A amplifier is the most simple. I'll draw you a basic circuit. This is using a MOSFET, but you can also do, th do this with bipolar transistors as well. But there's one principle that is true of all class A amplifiers. Uh, so with the MOSFET, um, we'll have a 12 volt supply, and I'll just draw you a circuit. So we have a MOSFET to ground, okay. This is the gate of the MOSFET. And we have then um, coming in to a capacitor. This is your audio in. Okay. And we have audio other side down to a ground. So this is where you feed your audio in. You have your MOSFET. And then you need a couple of resistors. So what you basically need to do We'll put a, a variable resistor to ground here. Another resistor to the uh, gate. And this sets the bias, which I'll just explain in a moment. Your output comes from here, through a capacitor, to your output. So this is effectively where you would connect your speaker. Okay. The idea of this bias is that you have to set the gate voltage so that the voltage at this point is half of the supply voltage. So if you have a supply voltage of 12 volts, by adjusting this resistor, you're effectively adjusting the voltage on the gate, okay? And you adjust that so that the voltage here is 6 volts. The idea of the other resistor here, by the way, is that even if you put the variable resistor all the way to one end, it can't connect directly. There's always some resistance between the drain and the, the gate. Drain, gate, source. So this is quite a simple circuit. You adjust this so you've got six volts here, okay? When you feed an audio signal in, AC, the capacitor lets the AC come through. The DC is blocked, so this will not affect the DC voltage here. So on the positive half cycle, you increase the voltage on the gate, the FET turns on more, and the voltage on the drain drops down towards zero, okay? When this goes negative, to the negative half cycle, you decrease the voltage on the gate, the FET turns a bit more off, and the voltage on the drain goes up towards supply. And if you have the correct amplitude coming in here, you can effectively change the voltage here from 6 up to 12 or down to 0. So effectively your output here is about 6 volts peak to peak. Okay. This capacitor here is to stop DC coming through your speaker all the time because your speaker diaphragm naturally sits in the middle, okay? The coil in your speaker, so your speaker has a coil inside it, which effectively is moving uh, in a magnet, so you have a magnet around this coil, and the coil is attached to the speaker cone, okay? So as you pass coming through here, one direction or the other, it magnetizes in one direction or the other, and that's what actually makes the speaker go move in and out. So that's how the circuit actually works. So the end of the coil obviously comes to here. So you don't want a DC voltage going through the speaker because the speaker cone would move to one end and stop there effectively when there was six volts on here. That means that it can't move further that way, so it can't reproduce the sound correctly. And anyway, having a DC voltage flowing through your speaker coil is not a good thing. So that's how this circuit works, basically. The advantage of it, it's very, very cheap, if you like to make it, it's a very simple circuit. The disadvantage is that this MOSFET 
is effectively always passing current. So even when there's no audio coming in, this is passing current. The voltage here is 6 volts, means there must be a voltage drop across this resistor. And the only way there can be a voltage drop across this resistor is if current's flowing through it. So the current flows through the resistor and through the FET. And that's the disadvantage of this design. These things are used in very low-powered amplifiers, maybe little transistor radios and such like. But even so, it's not a particularly good design because even if you had no sound, it's draining from the battery. Yeah? It's, it's, it's very inefficient. The efficiency of this circuit, that's the, the wattage that's turned into sound rather than the wattage that's just used to pass through this FET all the time. is about 25%. You can find similar circuits with bipolar transistors and more complicated ones with multiple stages. But the main thing you need to know about this one is that the output device is always passing current, even with no audio input. You can increase the output power of this by decreasing the value of this resistor. And if you like, putting more MOSFETs in parallel with each other so they share the load, they share the current flowing through them. But because it's always passing current, it will just get hot. So you'll need large heat sinks, you'll need large power supplies because of this quiescent current all the time. So effectively, as well as making a powerful amplifier, you're also making a rather good foot warmer or room heater, yeah? Um, there is one other advantage to this design, and why, this is why these are often used for things like headphone amplifiers and such like, and some audio purists like these amplifiers. And this is because this device is effectively handling the entire waveform, the plus and minus. All 360 degrees of the waveform is being handled by this. Therefore, there's no distortion. You can get a very pure signal here. So you can have a small input coming in, a large input going out, and there's nothing really to add any distortion to the waveform. So this gives you, if you like, the purest audio quality. But due to the reasons I was saying, it's only really used for low power amplifiers. Now let's have a look at the Class B amplifier design. And the whole point of the Class B amplifier is to get around this problem of wasted power to improve the efficiency of the amplifier. So with a Class B amplifier, you have a positive and negative supply rail. We'll put 12 volts in again, okay? And um, we'll have a minus 12 volts. The way you get these, by the way, normally is uh, in the power supply uh, to have a transformer, very dodgy transformer. Okay, I'll draw the transformer. I'll draw the diodes. So you'd have a power supply, basically something like this, with a center tap on the transformer. So the center tap is basically halfway down the winding. It's just brought to a connection, and that's connected to ground. You then have capacitors here, and you also have capacitor here or capacitors. And that basically gives you your positive and negative supply. So that's how you actually get the positive and negative supply. Now the amplifier, the class B, effectively I'll just show you here. So we know we have a plus, and it could be any voltage, I'll just use 12 volts. Just to represent what we can do. Okay. With the amplifier itself, we're using NPN in the PMP transistor. Again, it could be MOSFETs, and it could be an N type and P type, or it could be transistors. I'll use transistors in this one. So these are your two transistors. This one's an NPN transistor. This is a PMP transistor. Put the base on here. And then from the base, we have some bias resistors. So I'll just draw them in. OK. And these resistors are set basically so each transistor is off. Okay, it sets the base voltage so it's not on, it's off, it's not doing anything. 
it's not passing any current okay and the uh, audio input uh, comes here we use uh, two capacitors and this is where we feed the audio in okay and again the audio goes to ground and our speaker actually goes from here and the other end of the speaker is connected to ground so this center point this is effectively our ground now let's have a look how this works we feed an AC waveform in here the audio okay. when we're on the positive half cycle through this capacitor the AC increases the voltage on the base Okay. It won't affect the DC voltage here because the capacitor only passes AC, not DC. So we increase the voltage on the base, and as that increases, we turn the transistor on. So this transistor starts to conduct current down into the speaker to ground. Okay. So as this voltage is going up, the voltage on the emitter is also going up. Okay. Notice this doesn't invert the signal. Now, on the other one, the other half cycle, the voltage eventually comes to zero and goes below zero. And this be the PMP transistor, the base has to be below the voltage of the emitter to turn on. So this one now turns on. This one turns off because the voltage is below the emitter, and it's an NPN. The same as when this was conducting, the voltage here was above the emitter. Okay, So this handles the negative half cycle, this conducts and it pulls the voltage on the emitter down towards minus 12 volts. So this conducts a negative half cycle and this conducts a positive half cycle. At no point are both the transistors conducting at the same time. So the advantage of this is that when there's no audio coming in, there's basically no output current. There's no output that's not doing anything. Yeah? apart from the little bit of current that flows through the, re the resistors of course so that's how this circuit works and you can see it's much more efficient than the class a amplifier your output waveform now is basically going assuming we have the correct uh, level of input so we can fully drive this the output voltage of this literally can go up to plus 12 or minus 12 on this point so effectively we have about 12 volts peak to peak And that's for the given voltage, that's the actual maximum output. The disadvantage of this circuit, this class B amplifier, is that if you watch my video on transistors, all you need to know about transistors, you'll know that until the base voltage is about 0.6 volts above the emitter voltage, the transistor will not switch on. And the same with the PMP. The base has to be about 0.6 volts below the emitter before it will start to conduct. So in actual fact, you get a situation when the voltage audio waveform is near to zero, either side of zero, you get a point where this transistor is already switched off because the voltage here is now below 0.6. But this one isn't switched on yet because the voltage hasn't got to minus 0.6. And this is called crossover distortion. So what happens with your output waveform is effectively, as it goes through zero, it, it kind of distorts like so, yeah? And this is crossover distortion. At this point, one transistor is switched off, but the other one hasn't turned on yet. Another cause of distortion with this, these transistors are called complementary. So the NPN and the PMP transistor are selected to have matching characteristics but no matter how well you select the transistors it will never be exactly the same so you may find that this one turns on it may be 0.55 positive but this one doesn't turn on till maybe 0.58 negative so the distortion actually is not the same for either half phase so that's the advantage efficiency and the disadvantage of class b is crossover distortion. For this reason, you will not really find true Class B amplifiers these days. What you find is a halfway house between the two, and that is Class AB.
the way the class a b works is based on this circuit so what we do is we replace this resistor with a diode okay and we also replace this resistor with a diode semiconductor diode now a diode like a transistor junction has a voltage drop across it if you measure with your semiconductor analyzer you can see about 0.6 volts so what actually happens now with the two diodes in series is that this base will be about 1.2 volts higher than this base 0.6 on that semiconductor semiconductor junction and 0.6 on this one the two added together is 1.2 volts okay so now by selecting the value of the resistors you can actually modify the performance of this so that both transistors are just turned on just only just but they just turned on in the quiescent state okay the base voltages will be different because of this and they'll be different by 1.2 volts so we now have a situation where on the positive half cycle this transistor was already just slightly turned on so as the voltage goes positive we don't have to wait till it reaches 0.7 of a volt this starts to conduct straight away and it continues to conduct till it reaches a zero point again at the zero point this one starts to conduct straight away because the base voltage again was set to a point where it was just turned on so effectively by doing that we get rid of the crossover distortion okay and that is called class a b this is a very very efficient amplifier type it can be scaled up easily so that you can have many transistors in parallel we can do this sort of thing so we can add more transistors in parallel on both halves okay and the same obviously on, on the other half so we can do this sort of thing with it okay and we can make high powered amplifiers that don't generate so much heat as the class a they're much more efficient they're not wasting power because of the efficiency and the simple design of a class a b amplifier almost all consumer equipment with amplifiers in are class a b or at least they were until class d came out which we'll talk about a little bit later i'll just talk now because it's just a good time to mention this about this business of connecting lots of transistors in parallel and this is true whether the mosfets or whether the bipolar transistors when we have lots of transistors wired in parallel like this so effectively they're all wired across each other okay to share the load they're all driven from the same signal but although the transistors can be matched i mean some amplifiers you'll find that the transistors the output transistors would chosen specifically maybe from batches so the amplifier manufacturer bought large quantities of transistors and then they batched them so they put them in bins they binned them each bin having transistors of a very similar gain and a very similar base emitter voltage drop but even by doing that you can never absolutely match the transistors or mosfets so what you normally find in this type of arrangement is that you have a small value resistor on the emitter of each transistor okay this then goes to your loudspeaker uh, to ground and then the other side you'll have again small value resistors on the emitter of the pmp transistor going to minus 12 or whatever voltage we're using okay so you will normally find in fact i would say you will always find in transistors where they have in amplifiers where they have multiple transistors on the output stage you will find these low value emitter resistors and this is quite important when it comes to fault finding now let's talk about class g and class h amplifiers because they're very closely related to the class a b amplifier 
So we'll look again at the basic circuit that we just had. Speaker to ground. Minus volts, plus volts. Our resistors and our diodes in. So there's our basic circuit, the same we just had. Okay, and that way, input through the capacitors. I'm sure you can draw one of these yourselves now, the basic topology of this. Okay, so how much? Power, how much wattage are these transistors dissipating? Yeah, that's the question. And here's the question Are they dissipating the most wattage when they're switched off? So no current is flowing through them. Are they dissipating the most wattage when they're switched fully on? So all the current is flowing through them. Or are they disappointed? <laughs> are they dissipating? the highest wattage when they're half on and half off. Which do you think it is, guys? Which do you think is the time when they dissipate the most wattage? Well, the answer is not when they're fully conducting where they carry most current if you thought it was. And the reason for that is basically this. When the transistor is switched off, okay, when it's switched off, there's no audio input, there's no drive, it's switched off. There's no current flowing through the transistor. Now, wattage equals voltage times current. Okay. So when it's switched off, effectively, you've got 12 volts on this end. And via the speaker to ground, you've effectively got 0 volts on this end because this is a low resistance, maybe 4 ohms. So the voltage across your transistor is 12 volts. But the current is 0. So 12 times 0, 12 volts times 0 amps, equals 0. So basically, when the transistor is off, the wattage is 0. Uh, 0 watts. And that makes sense. That's kind of intuitive. It's not passing any current. There's no wattage. What happens when the transistor is fully turned on? Well, when it's fully turned on, the emitter is basically shorted to the collector. The resistance collected to emitter is very low, maybe 0.1 of a volt, 0.1, 0.2, something like that, yeah? So all the voltage appears across the speaker. So at this point, you've got 12 volts across your speaker to ground. If We'll use 12 volts again, okay? But you've got almost no voltage across the transistor. So where's the wattage being dissipated? Well, the transistor now has almost zero volts, but it has a little bit. Let's call it 0.1 of a volt. And the current, what's the current? Well, this is a 12 volt supply and your speaker is four ohms. So Ohm's law says, if this was short, that the maximum current can flow is three amps. So Ohm's law says I equals V over R, which is 12 over four, which is three. Yeah. 3, 4, and 12. So the current flow is 3 amps. What's the wattage dissipated by the transistor? 0 0.1 times 3. Yeah. Which is like 0 0.3 watts. Okay. So when the transistor is fully turned on, the wattage dissipated by it is very low. The closer this is to zero, the closer the wattage is to zero. All the wattage is actually being now dissipated by your speaker. Yeah. Uh, which is 3 times 12 equals 36 watts, if we're talking DC, okay. which we are at the moment. So that's what you have. So in both cases, when the transistor is on or the transistor is off, the wattage dissipated is basically zero. What happens when it's half on and half off? Well, now, effectively, we have 6 volts here, okay, whichever one. Plus or minus, it's, it's still six whether it's positive or negative, okay? This applies to either positive or negative. Apart from you can't have minus watts, okay? So when it's half on and half off, you've got six volts across the transistor 
then you've got six volts across the speaker. Yeah, the resistance of the two is, is the same, four ohms, four ohms. So it's, it's a voltage divider. So we've now got six volts across our speaker. Okay, what's the current flowing? Well, it's half of what it was when it was twelve. Yeah, you can do the maths again. Six over four equals one point five amps. Okay, so there's now one and a half amps flowing through our transistor. What's the voltage across the transistor? Six. So the wattage now is 6 volts times 1.5 amps equals 9 watts. Yeah? You can see that. And the other 9 watts, by the way, has been dissipated by the speaker. If it's DC. So this is why the transistors get hot and then amplify. This is why they have to have heat sinks on them. Okay, the voltage is always changing. The wattage is always changing. But on average, your transistors are probably dissipating half the wattage of the speaker. Yeah, or half of it each, if you like, because we're on off the time each. So a quarter there, a quarter there, and half of it there. But they're all going to be on the same heat sink. So at the end of the day, half the wattage is going into the heat sink. Now, this problem only becomes worse if you decrease the resistance of the speaker, the two ohms, you double the current, you double the wattage. If you increase the voltage here, to a higher voltage, say 24, and minus 24, you're doubling the voltage, you're doubling the wattage again, okay? So, this situation of wasted heat will increase with the wattage. You can put more transistors in parallel, like I showed you, and bigger heat sinks and cooling fans, but you're wasting a lot of power. So you might think, well, why not keep the voltage down? Yeah, keep the voltage down. Well, this comes down to the maximum wattage that the speaker can produce yeah so with the 12 volt supply i showed you even when the transistors are fully on in dc the maximum watt is about 36 watts yes there's an rms formula but the maths don't matter you could only get a certain wattage out of a speaker with a plus or minus 12 volt supply if you want more you either have to reduce the resistance of the speaker or you have to increase the voltage you can only reduce the resistance of the speaker so far. So at the end of the day, the only practical way to get more wattage out is to increase the voltage. And as I've just shown you, increasing the voltage increases the power, the wattage dissipated by the transistors and the hotter it runs. So this is where, and I know it's a bit of theory there, but this is where your class G and class H amplifiers come in. So this is a class G amplifier. We have the same setup, the class AB. The amplification is the same. It's working the same as this was working. And typically, this is used on high-powered amplifiers. So when you get into the hundreds of watts up to the kilowatts and so, this is where you use these sort of circuits. So typically, for an amplifier of this sort of power, you need a supply voltage, maybe a plus or minus 80 volts, plus or minus 90 volts. But because of the high supply voltage, it dissipates a lot of heat. So you have to make very big, heavy amplifiers. To get around that, what they normally do is they use a lower voltage. So for instance, this is quite typical. Plus 48 and minus 48 volts supply, okay? These speakers connecting to ground. So the waveform effectively on here can go peak to peak plus or minus 48, yeah, which is like 96 volt, okay, peak to peak. What they then have is another voltage rail at double this one. So you'll have a 96 volt positive, then you'll have a 96 volt negative supply. And here, they fit transistors or MOSFETs, and these could be MOSFETs. But we'll use transistors, why not? Quite typically, these use MOSFETs here and transistors here, I will say. So basically, we have a transistor that's effectively wired here. And we have another transistor that's effectively wired here. NPN, PMP. And this transistor can basically supply the higher voltage so the circuit effectively monitors the amplitude of the signal 
And when the amplitude is low, it's just using the 48 volt supplies, okay? And your sine wave's here. If the sine wave gets to the point where it's going to go above 48s on the peak, yeah, it turns on these transistors and then gives you twice the voltage to the transistor. So now you can go up to 96 volts, just about. And the same on the negative. And when you get to quieter passages of music again, it goes down. And this can work very quickly. I mean, normally the big peaks are on like the bass thumps, the boom, boom, boom of the music, yeah, especially the good stuff they play. So these are switching on and switching off as and when they need it. And that increases the efficiency again. And it means you can make an amplifier with smaller heat sinks, less weight. The disadvantage is that it's more circuitry. You've now effectively got four devices fit on the output and again there may be more of them in parallel so like i was showed you previously you might have like four of these in parallel four of these in parallel and so on lots more devices more circuitry more complex circuitry because it has to monitor the voltages and know when to switch these on and off but that is a class g amplifier okay class h is so similar to this we'll use the same diagram with a class H amplifier, instead of this switching between a low voltage and a high voltage, as and when is needed, effectively a class H amplifier modulates the power supply voltage. So the power supply can go anywhere between plus 48 and plus 96, minus 48 and minus 46, or whatever, 96, or whatever values they use, but these are quite typical. So with a class H, you're not switching between two voltage rails. You're actually changing the power supply, the voltage rail in real time. You're modulating the power supply voltage to suit the output waveform. And that is a class H amplifier. Remember I said with this circuit that the only way to increase the wattage, the power output, is to either decrease the resistance of the speaker or increase the voltage supply. That's not actually totally true. There's another way to do this. And you'll see this, and you may have seen this and wondered what it was, or maybe you knew what it was. Bridge mode. High powered amplifiers can run in bridge mode. So in bridge mode, you take a stereo amplifier and you run it in mono mode. And automagically by doing so, you can increase the power output of the amplifier. And the way that actually works, I'll just show you briefly, is this. So we'll use the 12 volt supply, although this is used on higher powered amplifiers with higher voltages, but we'll do it. So again, we have our class AB amplifier. I won't bother with all the resistors, but this is all there, yeah? This is your left hand channel. And on the same amplifier, you take your right hand channel. So again, you have your. Uh, Transistor, let me go to the other one. Plus, minus, plus, minus. Yeah, plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts. Yeah. And what you do in bridge mode, these are your two stereo channels. You feed them with the same audio signal, but out of phase. So effectively, when this one's going positive, half cycle like so the other one is actually getting the same waveform upside down okay so this is actually getting the negative and then the positive that way okay so what actually happens now is on the positive half cycle this transistor turns on and conducts yeah and you put your speaker here okay that's where your speaker goes so it conducts through here, okay? And on this side, remember I said this is inverted. So when this is getting the positive half cycle, this amplifier is getting the negative half cycle upside down. So the PMP transistor turns on. So the current flow is like that. Okay? And then opposite way, negative half cycle, this one's conducting, and this is upside down. So this one's conducting. So the current flow is like that. Now, with the same supply voltage, look what you've got. You can actually now double the voltage across 
the speaker. So rather than being on this, where it can be plus or minus 12, one end of the speaker is connecting to ground, so this end can only be plus 12 or minus 12. Yeah, It can only be plus or minus 12. This is ground. In this case, when this is plus 12, this is minus 12 on the other end of the speaker. And when this is plus 12, this is minus 12. So now you've got plus or minus 24 volts peak to peak. Okay? So you've doubled the supply voltage to the speaker. And therefore, for the same resistance of speaker, you've now increased the wattage. Yeah, you doubled the wattage. Okay, so that is bridge mode. I think I can fit this here, class D. So with a class D, these are sometimes called digital amplifiers, but they're not digital. They're actually pulse width modulators, and this circuit is very similar to a buck converter. So with a buck converter, you've probably seen this, I've shown this before. We have a voltage supply, okay? And we have two MOSFETs going to ground, okay? This is your high side MOSFET and this is your low side MOSFET. You see these in VRMs all the time, okay? And if you've seen me draw these, this comes from a pulse width modulator. Pulse width. My pen's given up. Let me find a new one one moment. We have on the book converter, effectively, capacitor to ground. Okay. So this is your output voltage. And with the pulse width modulator, by varying the on time and off time at very high frequencies of the MOSFETs, you can vary the voltage that's here, okay? And you normally do this to make a stable voltage of VRM. But think about it. If we have an audio signal coming in here, okay, and we sample this very, very fast, maybe into the megahertz, millions of times a second, and we sample the voltage at that point, yeah, or there, or there, or there. The voltage will vary. And we can modulate the width of the pulses to match the amplitude of the signal. Okay, so when the waveform's up here, we get a very wide pulse relatively to down here. When it's down here, we get a very narrow pulse, okay? And that's what this is doing. So it's modulating using the incoming waveform. So the voltage here is varying depending at that instance on the amplitude of the input. So we have that there, and in a normally, in a um, class D amplifier, you have two of these. So we'll have another one here, okay? To ground, base again. These can be controlled effectively by the same pulse width modulator over here, controlling everything for us, okay? And we have coming out, same thing, inductor coil, capacitor to ground, okay, and an output voltage. With the amplifier, what we do is we connect our speaker to here. Okay. These capacitors are not large electrolytic capacitors, they're small capacitors. For the simple reason we don't want a stable voltage here. We want the voltage to be varying depending on the amplitude of the, of the incoming waveform. But we need the capacitors to filter out the switching noise. This is switching very rapidly. So these coils and these capacitors effectively filter out the very high frequency switching, the pulses. And what we get coming out is a smooth waveform that represents the input one. And this is the most efficient type of amplifier, it's a class D. These are often used again in PA systems, commercial amplifiers, club, disco amplifiers and such like, some high-end home audio amplifiers. And also, these are used in car stereos, particularly, because of the high efficiency. And what you can do with an amplifier like this, often, they are combined with a switch mode power supply. So, for instance, on your car stereo, the high-powered ones, the amplifiers, um, 
you can only get, as we explained, a certain amount of wattage out of a 12 volt supply. So those type will commonly take the 12 volts coming in, switch mode like DC to DC converter, creating a much higher voltage, which then feeds into this. This is also similar to that bridge circuit, if you, if you look at it. Uh, very similar, yeah. So that's a class D amplifier. Let's have a look at the test equipment we need to repair amplifiers. Now, there is a lot of very specialist equipment around and quite expensive equipment. If you actually want to test amplifiers in as much as you effectively measuring the distortion, uh, there's often little trimmer pots and adjustments you can make in the amplifier uh, that you know will balance the uh, output between the two channels that will effectively affect the amount of distortion that's generated that will balance within the circuit to the voltage between the various transistors and for sure that specialist test equipment has a use if you're repairing amplifiers on a professional basis and you're doing lots of them but probably like me you just want to fix amplifiers and really you just want to get them working your customer wants it working and if that's the case then you don't really need a lot of specialist equipment so I'm sure those will shout out at the screen and say they disagree with that and that's fine that's fair this is just from my experience of repairing amplifiers and what I needed to do the job okay so the first thing you're gonna need is a multimeter nothing special about your multimeter any decent or half decent multimeter will do the job and this will probably get you to the cause of lots of lots of faults just with a multimeter but there's more equipment we can add to make life easier and the next item i would pretty much say this is essential as well when you're repairing amplifiers and it's something very simple you can build this yourself so this is a current limiter using two light bulbs basically the way this works is i plug the mains power in here i plug the amplifier in here and i can set it to limit and the current that's drawn by the amplifier then flows through the light bulbs. I'll just show you very quickly how you can actually build one of these. This is the current limiter circuit. We have live and neutral coming in, and the neutral connection goes straight to the output. So this is the socket on the output that goes to where I put the amplifier in. And the neutral just goes directly to there. I then have two light bulbs, and my light bulbs are wired like so. This is the first one, and the second one is just wired across the first one. And that's how they wired, two light bulbs. On mine, uh, one of them is a 60 watt, and the other one is a 100 watt. From here, then, this connection goes to the other output. The only other thing I have on mine is a switch connected from here to here that I can use to short the light bulbs out, which then means I have a direct connection. So when it's closed on mine, this is called mains, and when it's open, this is called limit. And that's basically the circuit of my current limiter. The reason this is essential is due to the way that amplifiers tend to fail. So one of the most common faults with an amplifier is that one or both channels have blown. That means the output transistors have run short circuit and possibly other devices as well. Now, it's quite common for you to come along, you'll uh, get your multimeter, you'll find the short circuit output transistors, you'll replace them and you might even figure out that the pre-drivers, the driver that's driving the output transistors also blow, and you might change them. But what you probably didn't spot is that the base emitter resistors have gone open circuit, or some similar problem in the circuit. So you then plug your amplifier back in, switch it on, only to find it instantly commit suicide due to the fact that you didn't find the other components that were faulty, yeah? And it, you've now blown all the parts you put back in, you have to start again. When we use this, we can power the amplifier through here. We can set it to limit, 
we can switch it on. And if that sort of situation occurs, the light bulbs will come on because it's trying to draw a lot of power. But that means that the power it can draw is limited to these light bulbs, in my case, 160 watts. So instantly you'll know there's a problem, you can switch it off. And secondly, it's very likely that the components, the transistors that you replaced are okay because this stopped a massive amount of current flowing through them. The reason mine has two light bulbs, by the way, is because on some devices I only want to put 60 watts, some 100, 160, depending. Effectively, the more code I think it's going to draw, I might use to use higher powered light bulbs. And the way I switch between the two is very simple. I just unscrew the light bulb I don't need, okay? So I can have one, the other, or both. Uh, you can build these in lots of sort of ways. I tend to use this sort of thing where I use effectively just a backing box and a couple of sockets and a light bulb holder. I have another one, I'll show you the other one as well. And it's built in a very similar way. So get yourself one of these if you want to save yourself a lot of pain. And when I say get one of these, I mean build one of these. Save yourself a lot of pain when it comes to repairing amplifiers. In order of usefulness, but these next two devices are both pretty damn useful. One is a component analyzer. This is a DCA. 55 there are other components analyzers available this will obviously test transistors for you out of circuit but it will allow you particularly to measure the gain of a transistor and also to see if there's any leakage currents these type of faults occur in amplifiers when effectively due to age the transistors become worn out we could say and they start to leak or the gain goes and that can cause all sorts of problems and amplifiers in a lot of cases these circuits have to be balanced they have to be matched the whole performance of the amplifier depends on the components being within specification so one of these is very useful the other reason it's very useful is if you have blown output devices where you have an amplifier with many transistors in parallel Quite often those transistors are matched to each other so the gain is within a certain range. And if you fit transistors outside that range, then it won't work properly. It's quite possible that some of the transistors will blow because effectively due to a misbalance, they're not all switching on at the same time. So at some point in the waveform, only some of them are switched on and they're taking all of the load now. So this is, fairly essential. If you don't want to buy one of these, there are numerous product, uh, projects and circuits you can find online that will allow you to build a little device to measure transistor gain. In fact, I may actually do that as a project soon, so let's have a look on the way to video. If you're going to repair amplifiers a lot, or even just a few, you're going to find an oscilloscope very, very useful. It's one of the areas of repair where an oscilloscope will greatly help you to complete those repairs in a way that you wouldn't be able to do without it. So an oscilloscope is bordering on essential for amplifier repair. The good news is that because amplifiers work on audio frequencies, you don't need an oscilloscope with a wide bandwidth. In a lot of cases, you just want to know if a signal is getting to a certain point in the amplifier. So even one of the cheap oscilloscope kits will be a big help to you. And in fact, that's another uh, topic I'm going to look at in uh, upcoming videos of what can we get away with cheap to repair amplifiers. Other than that, see if you find yourself a second hand one. Another thing I found very useful in the past when working on amplifiers is this power supply. This bench power supply is a dual output, so it's dual 30 volts and it's a 3 amp supply. It's not a particularly high powered one, but it has current limit on it. And quite often I've had, I have faults in amplifier circuits. I use this to power the amplifier module out of the amplifier instead of the original power supply. And it helps me to trace faults with the current limiter on so that nothing is getting damaged. In a way, it kind of does what the current limiting light bulb did but a little bit better sometimes so that's a nice thing to have and you don't have to have a dual supply like this you could get away well, get away you could work perfectly well with two of these 
and just connect them in series. Um, so in fact, we got a plus and minus supply. That's the main point with amplifiers; they have plus and minus symmetrical power supply rails. Here's another one. Um, I don't use as much. Um, it's nice to have, but it's certainly no essential. This is a very I can mount it on top. You'll see my other current limiter, very similar to the first one, but with one light bulb on it. And this basically just allows me to vary the mains voltage from zero to full power. And it also allows me to see the current draw. So on here, I can just effectively just turn the knob, and you can see the voltmeter going down there. Yeah. So this allows me to run amplifiers on a low voltage supply. And again, it can help in fault finding where you have an amplifier, which effectively would just go bang if it had the full voltage going in. It kind of does again what the dim light bulb tester does in a similar way, although it doesn't limit the current in the same way. That's one of these nice to have things, uh, but okay if you manage to get your hands on one fine otherwise i wouldn't worry about it there's other ways to do what we can do with this for the main part one other meter that you don't need until you do and when you do this will save you a lot of time and effort uh, this is my esr meter it's for testing electrolytic capacitors and this will make life easier if you have vintage amplifiers in particular but any amplifiers can have 40 electrolytic capacitors and finding them can be quite difficult so if you have the funds get yourself an ESR meter this is about 45 euros again there's other ones available but the ones that are built into the little uh, component analyzers by which I mean these things these are not suitable really for measuring ESR if you're going to get an ESR meter get one of these okay these are nice little devices but ESR measurement nah, not really one other item that you may find useful for amplifier repair is a signal generator now this is uh, a little standalone signal generator it's good for generating sign and other waves for that matter at varying frequencies so we can use uh, one of these to make a sine wave at whatever frequency we want and inject that into the amplifier and effectively monitor the output this becomes more useful when you're trying to measure output power and distortion in a lot of cases repairing amplifiers you can just inject any audio source um, from a mobile phone from a computer and for that matter if you don't want to buy one of these but you want to inject sine waves you can find uh, free programs, if you look on the internet, uh, signal generator programs for your PC that effectively uses your sound card to generate frequencies. And for audio frequencies, that's fine. So you can also do this just effectively using the sound card on your PC. Um, this wasn't expensive. Um, actually, I've only ever really used it once, to be quite honest, and that was repairing a laser, funnily enough, not an amplifier. So some sort of signal generator is going to be very handy, but it could just be your sound card on your computer or even your mobile phone. Lastly, another quick mention about the oscilloscope. I mean, the oscilloscope really is very, very useful, but if you don't have one and you're on a tight budget, you can get away with a signal tracer. Um, these are very simple little circuits that allow you to listen to the signal anywhere within the amplifier circuit. I actually made a video a little while back showing how to use a little pair of PC speakers to determine if the BIOS on the graphics card was being accessed. And that same project is fine for signal tracing in audio amplifiers. So I will link that video to the end of this one and in the comments as well. Sorry, and in the description as well. And have a look at that if you're on the budget. In fact, another little project I have in mind is to build a little signal injector pen and a signal tracing pen as cheap as possible uh, for those of you out there who just want to do these things on the budget. And those things will be coming up in forthcoming videos. This is a typical schematic for a Class AB power amplifier. 
this schematic is for one channel of a stereo amplifier so the amplifier will actually contain two of these and you can also see if you look at it it's fairly symmetrical you can imagine you can sort of draw a line through here okay this side is the positive supply and this side is the negative supply these are your output transistors and you can see them here and you'll also see that they are complementary so these are NPN transistors these are PMP transistors and if you look across the circuit you'll pretty much see that as the case that it's a symmetrical circuit with NPN and PMP devices the audio comes in here and the speaker goes out here so this is the connection to your speaker and then that connects to ground so that's basically how it is the positive and negative supply can vary I think this one says 56 volts but you'll quite often find amplifiers with around about 90 volts on either rail especially if they're high powered amplifiers you know a kilowatt or something like that so that's a fairly typical circuit now it looks complicated but I wouldn't let that deter you don't worry about it too much I'll show you the main parts of it and I'll show you what mainly would go wrong with these sort of amplifiers so generally speaking this input circuitry doesn't fail if it does fail then it's probably either the cause of a catastrophic failure over here which is sent too much voltage over here or it's a case where you've got uh, transistors that are out of spec that the gain is wrong and such like so it doesn't give a symmetrical drive to here in which case usually it'll work but it'll be distorted you'll have some problems you know the sound quality would not be good so normally speaking you don't have a problem over here never say never but that's you know a good rule of thumb these two devices this one here and this one here are voltage regulators basically they're using transistors this is all discrete transistor bear in mind you'll find amplifiers that use integrated circuits and a lot of this and even the entire amplifier can be integrated and also you can find MOSFET amplifiers which are usually much simpler than this but very efficient high powered amplifiers back to these voltage regulators so you can see these are mounted on heat sinks it shows you a heat sink and a heat sink here and these basically just regulate the supply coming in so this part of the circuitry from here onwards all the lower end of it runs at a lower voltage than this end can you see that so effectively there's a, there's a divide down here between the high voltage and the lower voltage supply oh, George. so sort of down here if you imagine it's kind of like a, a divide okay so what's going to go wrong with this well faults come into a few types really one is the common plague we have of faulty capacitors now this amplifier is what's called direct coupled so through the audio path basically there aren't any capacitors between the various stages that gives a better audio quality but it can cause some problems but even said that there are capacitors in the amplifier and capacitors are known to fail so capacitors and audio amplifiers especially vintage ones is a good place to start it's probably a good idea to remove them and, and check them given your ESR meter and a capacitance meter or a multimeter with capacitance range that shouldn't be too difficult to do and it's well worth spending the time to do that if it's particularly old it might just be worth replacing all the capacitors the electrolytic ones so that's one of the type of fault you find another common type of fault that's due to age is faulty trimmer pots can you see this thing here this is a variable resistor and this is being used to balance the voltage between these two transistors some amplifier circuits will have more than one of these trimmers yeah they look like these so so these are a, a trimmer pot as you can see them uh, they come in various styles but these have an habit of going open circuit so that the little slider loses contact to the track 
just due to age and maybe corrosion and dust. So that's quite a common failure. If you find this sort of fault, it will probably cause damage to other parts of the circuit. It's not unlikely if one of these fails, you might blow the output stage. So it's something to have a look at and I would suggest if the amplifier has these in it, to test them all and if anything looks suspect, to change them. Look for open circuit ones, open circuit to the wipe and that's the main thing with those. So moving towards this end of the amplifier. These are your output transistors. You can see you have three in parallel, one, two, three. And you could have more. Our amplifier has 10, the one we're going to look at. But three, four, four is quite common, six, eight of these in parallel. And these all share the load. So your main current path on this amplifier, and we'll take a different colored pen. Your main current path is from the high voltage supply through the fuse, there's a fuse, yeah. Through these transistors into the speaker and to ground yeah that's the main current path and then the other side from the negative supply so it effectively flows that way through these transistors and through the fuse okay so that's your main current path and as you probably know with the electronics that which works hardest fails quickest <laughs> i think i just made that up yeah Work hard, work hard, play hard, and die, yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily hard. So that's what tends to happen. Usually because somebody's been overdriving the amplifier, so they're putting too much power out of it. Yeah, too much power coming out. Loud parties, okay. Uh, loud club nights. And that's quite often. If people don't drive an amplifier properly, what happens is it gets to a point called clipping. So clipping is where you have these are your voltage rails 90 volts minus 90 volts yeah this is ground zero volts and your waveform is, is kind of doing this in between yeah and if you drive it too hard you can get to a point where the waveform wants to go above 90 volts but it can't so at that point it stops yeah comes down and again it hits the, the limit yeah and what happens is, I'm sure you can see the waveform is, is effectively flattening like this, okay? Yeah, these flat bits. This is clipping. This is very bad for the amplifier because your speaker is an inductor. When you're feeding AC through it, it has a reactance, a resistance is an inductor. When you start to clip at this point, you're feeding DC through the speaker and more current will flow. It's very bad for your speakers, you can blow the speaker coils, and it's also very bad for your amplifiers, you can blow the output devices. And usually if you blow one of these output devices or more, you'll blow these output devices as well. So these will go short, and when this tries to come on, these will go take all the current straight through. The current now flows not through your speaker, but through the fuse, directly down through here and back through the fuse, okay? That's where the current goes. There's nothing in the way to stop it, and you blow these transistors okay <clears throat> that's a very common failure mode in amplifiers and another reason short circuit load or somebody just too low impedance or load they put too many speakers on the output thinking they can and it's now too low resistance so that is a very very common and this is what's called a blown amplifier when a transistor blows and goes short circuit you can do it in various ways so your transistor Collector, emitter, base. It can go short circuit from the collector to the emitter. Yeah, this is now a short circuit. And all the current, the high voltage, will flow through here, as I've just shown you. Yeah, and probably blow all those as well, and then they're both short. And that will blow the output stage. But to make matters worse, sometimes it can go short circuit to the base or to the base as well. If that happens, the high voltage that's on here, say 90 volts, comes through your transistor into the base. And that base, you can see, is wired into this other part of the circuit. And it's connected directly to these other devices. There's no capacitors to block the DC. So what happens now? More voltage comes into this transistor. 
than this transistor really likes to have, yeah? And they don't like it up then. So basically, these transistors blow. And you now have a cascade effect, which can go back through the amplifier. So you can have a situation where many devices are blowing in the channel. If you find blown output transistors, shorted output transistors, it's very easy to check. I'll show you in a moment on the amplifier how we do it. If these are short, you need to then check the driver transistors and you need to work your way back. It might be worthwhile to start removing devices. I mean, one good suggestion is that you may be able to remove these or in other way isolate this half of the amplifier from this half of the amplifier and then feed the signal in and test that the signal is okay as far as a certain point. Yeah, that's possibly a good way to test uh, that. So that's one of the big problems you have with amplifiers and why sometimes they can be expensive to repair, especially when the parts are hard to get at the vintage ones. This, by the way, is where the uh, dual bench supply comes in useful, that you can actually power up part of the circuit, some of the voltage rails, and effectively makes it easier to fault find without starting to test every component, uh, possibly take them out of circuit, probably you would have to do. So that's one of the times that uh, dual bench power supply would be useful. But that isn't the end of the woes with amplifiers. There's another problem as well, and this is quite common. When these transistors go short circuit, you'll notice that, sorry, you'll notice that these transistors have resistors in the emitter connections. And these are low value resistors, these are 0.3 ohms on each one. And these effectively are to balance the transistors because your transistors, when you apply a voltage to the base, they may not all turn on at exactly the same point. So these resistors here, and these resistors here in the base, that's these and these, allow you to balance the transistor so that it doesn't matter if one's turning on slightly before the other. Okay. In fact, it really is to make them all turn on at the same time, even though the voltage you apply between the base and the is slightly different, will turn on at the same time. So they'll all come on together. That's the more truth of it. These low value resistors quite often will go open circuit. So if you have short circuit transistors, you're very likely to have open circuit emitter resistors as well. And if the voltage comes back into the base, you may well have open circuit base resistors. These are also quite low value resistors, 3.3 ohms. So once you find the failure here, you can replace the transistors, but before you do, once you've taken these transistors out, you need to test all these resistors to see if any of them have got open circuit. A common thing you'll also find with an amplifier mentioning is you'll find a blown fuse. So you'll find one or both of these fuses have blown. Now, that's a visual thing, but the fuse is blown for a reason, and it's probably blown for this reason. Almost always, I accept fuses can just fail. But normally, if a fuse has just failed, it's just open circuit, you can see the wire's broken. If this has happened, it's probably black inside it, it's vaporized, yeah? So, don't just replace the fuses, you need to test for shorts first, you need to test for all this lot. And the same applies. When you open an amplifier, one of the first things you might notice is that some of the resistors are burnt. And you think, oh, I've got some burnt resistors here. I'll change them. And you can see the ones on the other side, and they're okay. So you know the value. You change these burnt resistors, because that's obviously what's wrong with it. Yeah, Obviously what's wrong with it. It's only the fuse is gone as well, but the resistors are burnt. So I'll change the re resistors, I'll change the fuse. You know where this is going, don't you? because these are still short. So when you plug it in, these just burn up again, yeah? So all that was these just, yeah, another little fire on the circuit board. This, again, is where that current limiting light bulb trick came in, so that it limits the current this can draw. It, these won't set on fire again, but you'll, you'll see you've got a short, the light bulb will come on, yeah? So that's another uh, thing with amplifiers. So there's lots of things you might think that are against you when you're repairing amplifiers. But there's two things that are kind of for you. Yeah? 
one of them, as I mentioned, this circuit is basically symmetrical. Yeah. Which means that if you have burnt components on the positive half, and you'll find this sometimes, you'll find an amplifier where the positive side is blown, but the negative side hasn't, okay? Or components at least are burnt in different ways. So quite often, you can figure things out by comparing with the other half because of the symmetrical weights designed. If something's blown up, you'll know what it is. And even better than that, most amplifiers are stereo amplifiers. And the stereo amplifier has two of these, okay? And if you look, in a lot of cases, only one channel is blown because the fault was on one channel. The other one didn't have, or one blew before the other one could, yeah? So again, you have another channel which you can compare all your tests and your readings with the blown one and work your way through making comparisons. Just to show you what these transistors look like, these are fairly typical with older amplifiers. This is an MJ2955. This is actually an MJ3000, which is not a complementary one of this. So this is the PMP, and this would have an MJ3055, which is the matching complement. I just didn't have any to show you. Um, sometimes they look like this, which is a slightly different style, but basically the same thing. This case is called a TO. Three style transistor, and usually these are mounted onto the heat sinks with little micro washers underneath, and little plastic uh, inserts in here where the bolts go through. And those inserts and the micro washers are essential because this has to be isolated from the heat sink, or at least some of them do. You might find, for example, all the ones on the positive side are bolted, and all the ones on the negative side have the washers. To insulate them. That's because the metal can is the collector. So when replacing these, you need to make sure you put the inserts in. And also, to be quite honest, when replacing output devices, we get into this issue of matching the gain. And this is where you should probably seek some advice on an audio repair forum rather than just put your devices in. Check with a few experts first. Even I do this, yeah? I can trace the fault, and when it comes to replacing these devices, I'll usually ask the experts, can I put this in? Um, another type you'll see on more recent amplifiers are these. Um, these are plastic ones. Again, these have the metal tab, so you'll have the, the little micro washer or a, a grey heat conducting washer underneath. This is typical of a complementary transistor pair. This is a TIP2955, it's like a, a plastic version of that metal one, and this is the 3055. And you'll see, they're both 100 volt uh, collector base, 60 volt collector emitter, these are maximum ratings, 5 volts emitter base, 15 amp, 90 watt transistors. So they're complementary. Although quite often the manufacturer of the amplifier will have also tested gain of them and as I mentioned before they'll, they'll bin them so that when they build the amplifier they use transistors all of a very similar gain as close as they can get to each other. Uh, they come in a few others, this is a, another type you might find and obviously you'll find MOSFET amplifiers but the devices basically look like these physically. So now we know basically what to look for in many cases, electrolytic capacitors, trimmer pots, output transistors, signal transistors, and resistors, quite often power resistors, or just normal type resistors, which are burnt, or just test faulty. Those are the main things you're gonna find wrong with amplifiers. Now we know that, we know what the circuit's looking like, we've got a good idea of where we're gonna look and how we're gonna test it. Let's have a look at a real life example. We'll get our very heavy amplifier back on the bench and let's see if we can fix it. It's very tempting to get hold of the multimeter and start testing around the amplifiers, looking for shorts and the various things we just mentioned. But actually that isn't the best place to start. The best place to start is not to use this, but to use these, yeah? so. Have a good look first, look around the amplifier. Can you see any obvious problems? And 
for example, burnt resist that I was just mentioning. But in general, have a good look around. Loose wires, anything like that. And the first thing I noticed on this, before I started to make this long video, I was doing a repair video, was that there was a problem down here. So I'll just show you what I spotted on the visual inspection I already made. One I prepared earlier, as they say. This is one I prepared earlier. And then we'll continue with the diagnosis of this amplifier. And you can see a little transformer, looks like a linear relay. And, oh, what's the, yeah. This, oh, oh, that's interesting. This looks like some sort of modification or previous repair. There was a resistor here, and I just touched it, and there's a wire. This green wire was just soldered onto the that was just fell off the resistor. That there. Um, I don't really know what that's doing. I mean, it looks like a. Uh, was it a one of the resistor or something like that? Um, uh, maybe uh, one of the resistor, maybe a 10 ohm resistor actually. Um, so that's there, and that's. I'm not quite sure because it's kind of like trapped underneath this thing here. Uh, I think we need to get the other side off. Let's have a look to see if we can see something similar on the other channel. This is the other channel. I don't know which is the working channel, by the way. And this has two resistors down here in basically the same place that we can see on the other one. Um, but they don't appear to be exactly identical. This has a slight four-way connection coming on here. You can see that. Now, this is a ground terminal naught volts and then there's two resistors down there r7 and r6 if you look at the other side and i wish this thing was easier to move around okay so on this one we only have two wires on this not four but it seems to be basically the same plug this is the ground terminal and then these resistors i think of the ones under here that somebody's done some work on this at some point so we probably need to have a look to see what that actually is we have under there and maybe this is just what's wrong with this one wires fell off i didn't do this at work so i've no idea what it exactly entails oh i see yeah so we can see down here now that there's a hole burnt in the pcb under there and that's where those resistors go I think probably the best thing to do with this is going to be to get the two amplifier modules out if I can uh, and I can get them on the bench and we can compare the two and then maybe start to figure out what we can do with this actually on second thoughts I think I'll just repair this someone's obviously worked on this at some point in the past and repaired this burnt area of this PCB so it might just be a case that if I just solder this back on here because somebody else has already figured this out before me that it might just work so because it's probably not going to be too easy getting these amplifier modules out I'm not sure um, let's just try this first so let's solder this back on here let's power it up and let's see what it actually is doing I've soldered uh, that wire back onto that resistor I just noticed on here there's a uh, tested by Dave uh, June 1988 and the one on the other side it says Nigel December 1990 so this is quite an old amplifier I mean you're looking at like 34 years old <laughs> which is getting on a bit for an amplifier um, but just goes to show these things were kind of built to last year although there's something wrong with it at the moment you can see I've fixed the problem with the broken wire on the resistor. So that actually might be all that was wrong with this. But we can make some checks before we power it up. And then we can test it if the checks pass okay. I have a schematic for this uh, amplifier, which I downloaded. I'll put the link into the description of this video. And I'll also put it on the Learning Electronics Repair Discord server as well. And it's actually quite an unusual design. I had to ask uh, one, well, I asked on Bad Caps Forum in the audio repair section, some knowledgeable guys there. I was asking if this is a class AB amplifier because you can see that all the output devices are NPN, 
and it shows two in each bag but there's actually 10 in each bag so there's 10 of these and, and 10 of these and if you look at the circuit you'll see that there's a transformer here which effectively drives the base of these transistors and the way this works as far as i understand it is that the two windings are out of phase with each other so in the case of this winding the positive half cycle is driving these transistors and the output which is connected from here the speakers is being pulled towards the positive supply rail and on the negative half cycle i believe this actually inverts the signal so this sees it as a positive signal switches these transistors on but because they're connected to the negative supply rail it pulls the speaker connection down towards ground so although they both effectively amplifying what they think is a positive half cycle one's really the negative half cycle and because these are taking the speaker connection in either direction positive or negative you get the correct output that's the way i i understand it i'm sure there's going to be guys watching this who can tell me exactly how this works so the guys on bad caps tell me this is a class a b amplifier albeit one with a rather unusual design so we have that that's handy the first thing we're going to check is whether there's any shorts from any of the transistor collectors to ground or to the, the voltage rails so let's have a look at that now on our amplifier if we just look at the schematic in a little bit more detail you'll see that the positive and negative power rails which are marked with the dotted lines here actually go through the relays so these two relays we saw on the other side of the PCB effectively connect the power and I'm assuming that with the amplifier powered off there's no connection the relays are open so although normally you could measure the resistance across the main capacitors to see if there's a short in the output transistors in this case you can't because the relay is open so what I'm going to do is to make sure we have no short circuit transistors is to measure from the collector to the emitter and this is quite easy because the emitters have these resistors in them you can see these resistors here a small value resistor and they're actually if i zoom the camera out one moment those resistors are actually here by the transistors so quite easily if we just move on continuity mode you'll see that all the collectors of the transistors in each bank are connected together okay so that's all one bank and this is the other bank yeah and this just took a second to respond there so all these collectors are connected together now between the two collectors obviously there'll be open circuit so that's effectively telling you there isn't a short through this one to the collector of the other one that's basically uh, a short from here to here but the quick way to tell again is we just go on the bank of transistors anywhere and we go to one of the emitter resistors and if there's a short circuit this will find the short circuit on any of the transistors because all these emitter resistors are low value so you would only read an ohm or two if there was a short onto any of the transistors so that's fine 560 ohms yeah and we could do the same on this side we can just go to the emitter resistors okay that's fine and well i'll just do the same on the other channel as well so so far i'm not finding any short circuits okay and that's okay yeah i also found with the schematic with this actually some service notes as well so we know there's no shorts on the output stages but let's have a quick look at these service notes and see if there's anything else we can test so first of all this is telling you what to do if you've replaced any output devices any transistors we haven't done but we can still make some of these checks so it's saying that without the relays if we remove the relays we can check some resistances and it basically is saying that between the emitters and the collectors we should read 500 to 900 ohms so we can check that and between the base and the emitters three to five ohms okay the relays are held in place with little spring clips and they're quite easy to remove you just take something with a hook 
shake down and just flick it against under the back of the clip push down slightly and, and they should actually just kind of like clip out yeah there we go so i can clip those out quite easily yep it's off the relays will now come out so i'll get both of the relays out and then we can measure some resistances okay so i, I have the relays um i don't think this will actually make any difference on the collector to emit it reading but let's see what we have oh yes it's gone up yeah it's gone up so it's now 840 and it's saying it should be between five and 900 so that's good it's gone to the side make a good contact on it yeah 843 it doesn't matter which end of the resistor you reach it because the resistor is a very low value maybe half an ohm so it won't make much difference and we can do the same on the other side as well um, so again to one of the resistors and we just go to the yeah 835 slightly different 838 so they're a little bit different but they're not very different so i'm not too concerned about that at the moment uh, another thing it mentions in the instructions here is to test all the emitter resistors this is something i mentioned in the guide earlier you should always do this so the emitter resistors we know are these and they read let's see what they are well 0.6 yeah so it's not short but it's low about half an ohm that's what i thought they were so I need to go along and just check that all of the resistors are okay on both banks on both channels. So that'll just take me a few minutes. So I'll be back with you in a moment. Okay, that all checked fine. So uh, I'm happy with this one. Um, base rail to emitter rail, three to five ohms. So we need to look at that one now. Um, now the base emitter resistors, sorry, the base rail resistors are these ones here so from the collector to the base. Yeah, to all the bases you can see there. And there's another one on this side. There'll be somewhere, yeah, R12 to there. And the same for the other channel. So where there was one emitter resistor per transistor, there's one base resistor per bank. So there's only four of them. And we need to check from the, what was it saying? Yeah, we need to check basically from the base to the emitter, three to five ohms. So let's have a look to see where these resistors are. The base resistors are actually these two large ones. I looked them up on the board and see from the actual part number. So, um, or rather component number. So there they are, but they're a little bit difficult to get the meter underneath these to actually read them. If you look at the schematic, you'll see the resistor actually comes down to one of these windings on the transformer. There's two windings on the secondaries, which I think we can assume is here and here. Yeah, two pairs of windings. So it's gonna be easiest, I think, to measure from the end of the transformer winding to the emitter. Now, it doesn't really matter which side of the winding because the resistance is so low anyway. And even these resistors are very low. So let's see if we can actually do that. Um, so we'll put the emitter back on. It's just uh, gone to sleep. Okay. I'll put it back into the uh, ohms range. Or even continuity. Okay. So these are the two winds. I can see them on the transformer. So if I go from them, yeah, I'm going to have to stand this up on its side so I can actually get to the emitters as well. I can't get to them from this side of the PCB, which means basically you can't really see what I'm doing, but let's have a go anyway. Oh, actually, I did find a way to test it from this side. So one of the emitter rails, which is here, you can see it goes to the positive speaker output on the back of the amplifier. So that's easy to get to. And the other emitter rail, you can see, goes to one of the pins on the relay contacts. That's also easy to get to. So let's now have a look to see if we can find these. 
I'm looking between three and five ohms. So one of the transistors, I'm not sure which, sorry, one of the emitted rails, one of the banks goes to the positive of the speaker output. So yeah, it's that one, 3.5 ohms. It'll probably read the same from both sides, yeah. Three, 3.5, okay. So depending which side you read to, that's there. And then the other one is in the relay contacts. So let's have a look. So we'll go to here, and it's one of these contacts. That one. It doesn't go anywhere else. No, it doesn't go anywhere else. Okay, it goes to this one. So again, that's 3.5, and is it 3 from this end? Yeah, very close. 3. Okay, so that reads okay. I'll now just make the same reading on the other channel. Um, you can't see, it's too heavy to move this thing around, but I'm sure you'll know what I'm doing. So positive speaker terminal. Well, this channel actually reads a bit higher. 4.4, okay. And what's it read to the relay contact? Let's have a look. So we've got to go to the same relay contact. Three. Three point three. So actually one of the emitter rails reads a little bit higher than the other three of them, which might indicate a problem. Um it's the, it's the first thing we found it actually reads anything different. It's actually four point four rather than three. But according to the information here, if it's between three and five, it's okay. So I think now we can continue. So once we've made these checks, we can now power this up. And let's see what it's actually doing. I have the amplifier ready to test. I've connected it to the light bulb current limiter with both bulbs in. I've set it to a limit. So now I'm going to switch it on. And what should happen is these bulbs should come on and then go dim as the big capacitors charge up. If they come on bright, we know we've got some sort of short or some sort of problem here. So yeah, there we go. So we come on bright and then we dim down. Okay, so that's fine. It's not going to go bang. So now we can turn the amplifier on and let's see what happens with it. Well, it made a little bump noise. I'm sure the power's on. But I don't have any speakers or anything attached to it. So we can't really tell if it's working or not. Yeah, so I'll now get some audio leads. I'll get some speakers on this amplifier. And let's see if it actually works. I've attached some speakers to the amplifier. I'll just once again put it onto the current limiter in case there's some problem effectively a short. I mean, we didn't see any shorts, but once the speakers are attached, if some current can flow through the speakers. Uh, so let's see what happens. Oh, I if you heard it, it was a little bump on the speakers. Yeah, a little bump and a switch off. So that's a good sign. So let's connect an audio input now. Let's see if the amplifier is working. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. And we have it working. Hope we don't claim some copyright on this one. Just a demonstration, anyway, to show the amplifier is actually running. Yeah. Yeah, both channels running. So there we have it. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Um, I don't know how this is going to work out when I start making the video. And in the end, it was just that visual uh, problem, you know, with the, uh, the resistor, the, the wire it fell off. However, regardless of what the problem was, I do hope you've learned quite a bit about amplifier repair and now feel confident to get started if you've not done this sort of work before or a little bit more confident if you had a little bit of experience and maybe felt a little bit overwhelmed sometimes by amplifier repair. So that's it for this one. Um, I could ask you all to hit subscribe if you like it, but hey, that's an American thing, begging people to subscribe, isn't it? It seems to be. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say have fun and see you all soon, guys, on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now.